Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Yalla Y'all, conversations with activists working on the front lines for Palestinian and Black liberation. And before we begin, I would like to first explain the purpose of this series, and then I will introduce our guests. The purpose of the Yalla Y'all conversations is to highlight those activists who have been working consistently for the effective and complete liberation of Palestinian Black and Black people globally. Some of our guests are very well known in the racial justice movements that include Palestinian and Black liberation, but many are not as well known, but have been working on the front lines for Black and, and Palestinian people for decades. Also, as our guests will be sharing their stories as to how they became activists, we wanted to impress upon our audiences that one does not have to be famous or have any special credentials to become an activist. Most people become activists because they see something that is wrong that they want to bring awareness to and help to correct. So in other words, anyone can become an activist. All you need to do is to have a sense of compassion and care about people and the world and what's going on in the world. So with that, I will introduce our guest who is a very good friend of mine. We've been in the trenches for a long time and it's Bill Fletcher Jr who is the former president of Trans Africa Forum. He's a senior scholar with the Institute of Policy Studies. Um, he's the executive editor for the global African world worker.com and also an editorial board member of the black commentator.com and in the leadership of several projects. He is the author and co-author of several books, including the indispensable ally black workers and the formation of the Congress of industrial organizations. 1934 to 1941, which he co-wrote with Peter Agard, Solidarity Divided, The Crisis in Organized Labor and a New Path Towards Social Justice, which he co-authored with Dr. Fernando Gipassin, and They're Bankrupting Us, 20 Months About Union. Uh, Fletcher is also a syndicated columnist and a regular commentator on radio, television, and the web. So thank you very much, Bill, for coming on and being one of our our interviewers for this um, this interview with people who are you know that I've known for a long time who have been active not only in the Palestinian liberation movement and Black liberation movement but in other movements. So with that, I wanted to ask you, how did you first become an activist? What was your inspiration or or to become an yeah. activist? Well, first again, thank you, Felicia, for inviting me. Um, so there's how I became an activist and then there's how I got involved in Palestine. Right. Uh, so how I became an activist at a very early age, I mean, in elementary school, I was interested in world affairs. And I was growing up in the 60s. Uh, I was watching and listening to the news. Um, a neighbor of mine was in the Nation of Islam and or at least bought their paper regularly and gave me their paper. And so I read a lot of, about world events. But the trigger was when I read the autobiography of Malcolm X. And I was 13 and it just changed my life. It changed the way I looked at things. And I finished that book and decided that I needed to be a social justice activist. Um, and then along came the Black Panther Party, and I became a supporter of the Panthers. I read their paper. I would sell their paper. I built a couple of student organizations in high school that were aligned with the Panthers. And, I, you know, Felicia, I never stopped. I've just been active ever since. Went to college, uh, graduated, decided to get involved in the labor movement. And I've spent most of my adult life in the labor movement, black freedom movement, doing electoral work and uh, international work. And you know, the Malcolm X for many black people, especially those of, 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 the, of you who were in the sixties seem to have been an inspiration for, for many folks. Um, but um, there, so now I want to come to how you became an activist in the, the Palestinian liberation movement. And actually, there's a mutual friend of ours who says that you have a funny story about how that happened. So could you tell us about that? 
Yeah, it really is a funny story. Um, so I was in ninth grade. And again, I was interested in world affairs. And uh, in my social studies class, the teacher was a woman named Mrs. Schwartz. Very good teacher. Uh, but she was a Zionist, very strong Zionist. And so she decided that we were going to have a class debate about what was at that point called the Arab-Israeli crisis. And so she set up two debating teams, and I was put in charge of the Arab team. And so um, in preparation for that, I went to the PLO's office in New York City. I, I was living at that point in Mount Vernon, New York, which is right above the Bronx. So one day I, I took the subway down. The PLO's office was, uh, was very close to the Grand Central Station terminal you know, and in, in Manhattan. And so I found, it, found the office. I went down to the office. And it was about a week or so after their office had actually been bombed. Someone had put a bomb near there. And uh, it was in an apart, it was in an office building. So I knocked on the door and it was very unassuming. It was just like this office. I don't even remember whether it had the name PLO on it. And I knocked on it and the door slowly opened. And this guy was looking out to see who was there. <laughs> and, and so I said, you know, so I'm like 15 years old. So I said, hi, you know, I'm Bill Fletcher and I'm here and I, da, 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 da. Well, Felicia, they let me in and they were so generous mm -hmm. with their time. And they, uh, they gave me all of this material to read. Wow. And they answered all of these questions that I had. And so um, I thanked them, returned home. I prepared my team, my, my, my side, and we kicked the ass. <laughs> Of the Israeli side. it was it was not, and it was and it was so it was so well done th that what happened was Mrs. Schwartz, who was supposed to be the moderator, at a certain point, Felicia, she jumped in <laughs> on the, the Israeli, and the and the class went into an uproar, and they said, "Mrs. Schwartz, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to be neutral, right?" And so and so. She had to admit we won the debate. And, and when I and and I can't tell you how important that was to me. Because when because we did win the debate, we kicked the ass of the other side. And and I felt like, damn, if we can do it here, we can do it anywhere. Right. <laughs> and and so um, so I just started following more things, reading in the Panther paper. And one thing led to, and it just, it always was a part of my, my political work um, in one way or another. And, uh, and then I think there was, one of the challenges was trying to figure out how I could do it more regularly. Hmm. So like years later, um, two things happened. The U.S. campaign and the Israeli occupation hmm. was found. And I ended up getting involved with that. But the other thing that happened was that Andy Shalal, the oh. owner of Us Boys and Poets uh, franchise, came to me one day. I was running Trans Africa Forum. And he said, Bill, um, do you think it's possible to get Trans Africa involved around Palestine? And I started laughing and I said, I've been waiting for somebody to ask me this. I said, yeah, this is exactly what I want to do. And, and so Andy and I started talking about this vision that I had of what I called an African-American council on Palestine. And, and the idea was to try that, in my experience, a sizable percentage of African-Americans are almost like instinctively pro-Palestinian, but it is not at the top of our issues. And, and I said to Andy, what we need is an organization that's a vehicle to bring together African-Americans who really get the Palestinian issue and are willing to 
advocate. So um, we tried to get it off the ground, but it, it didn't succeed. Um, and, and, and it didn't succeed largely because we could not get the funding that we needed. I was actually able to convince my board that we should do this, uh, but we didn't get the funding. And I tried a couple of other times as well to build something along those lines. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's been, it's been very much a part of me and I've had battles with some people who will go nameless in the um, pro-Palestinian movement because one of the things I started arguing a long time ago is that there needed to be um, political action. There needed to be a political action component to our work. And that it wasn't just about lobbying, but we needed to make it an issue that became part of debates when people are running for office. Mm -hmm. okay. And I was told at the time, Bill, that will never happen. Mm -hmm. You know, that it would, just, it would cost too much money. We don't have that kind of money. And I said, no, we've got to start somewhere. We've got to start building base areas around the country where you actually have people that believe that this issue is important and bring it to politicians on a consistent basis, not just when we're pissed off at them, but bring it to them on a, a consistent basis. And then uh, to my joy, at a certain point, the US campaign, when it changed its name, uh, decided to set up a C4 and move in that direction. Mm -hmm. So truth crushed to the earth shall rise again. Yeah. <laughs> For those of you who are outside of the Washington, D.C. area, Bus Boys and Poets is um, a, just a wonderful establishment owned by um, an Iraqi American by the name of Andy Shalal, who has built, uh, it's a restaurant, but it's really a community center where people have come together. And I mean, you know, those of us who have been in several movements, particularly the anti-war movement, and the Palestine Liberation Movement. We've plotted and planned at Busboys and Poets. We've held different events at Busboys and Poets. So I just wanted to give a shout out to Andy for his graciousness in allowing us all to come together and bringing these movements together. And yeah, I, I um, met Andy through my work with Damu Smith uh, through Black Voices for Peace. And he was very gracious with us in terms of uh, help, help, helping us get our events off the ground and all of that. So, yeah, and you know, to your point also, it's been a battle kind of talking with our Palestinian American and Palestinian brothers and sisters about the, the, the complexities of American politics and how, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you and I wouldn't probably be living around in the world and doing what we're doing if it weren't for the fact that there was some legislative movement to uh, to to formulate our the pieces of our liberation that have allowed us to do what we're doing today and and not be in I mean relative terror um, as people were back in the 1960s and 40s and 50s. AMP just got off its uh, 13th annual convention and you were part of a, a very rich um, discussion on black and Palestinian liberation. And we had several other speakers who were talking about this. So I kind of want to go back to that, to some of that discussion in terms mm -hmm. of what do you see going forward in terms of our movement and how, you know, maybe going backwards, but also going forward, how do we how do we need to, what's the need right now for us to go forward in terms of formulating a more consistent and, uh, relationship with uh, the Palestinian liberation movement and the black liberation movement? Well, I really think without uh, sounding like a broken record that we need the kind of organization that I described. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things, Felicia, that I have concluded is that these delegations that go to Israel and Palestine um, have a, a, a mixed value because when people return, if there's not something for them to do right away, we lose them. 
And I took a delegation, an African-American delegation, Israel and Palestine, in January 2014. It was a very challenging trip. Um, and I think part of the reason was that we had certain disruptive elements on the trip, but the other part of it was that I think that the visit traumatized oh. people. And some people started acting up as a result um, and, and clearly were very uncomfortable. But the trip, everyone appreciated the trip. But when they returned, they dispersed. Huh. And um, I attempted to stay in contact with several of them, uh, but it was, it was very hard. It was very hard. So, you know, it's like the, the intensity of this, like, I think it was seven to 10 days. I can't remember. The intensity of that trip, you would have thought would have kept people together and kept people in touch. That, that didn't happen. And, and while uh, some members of that trip have, at different points, I think, written certain things and spoken, it hasn't been enough. On the other hand, if we had had something like an African-American council in Palestine, and we could have said, you know, when, when people returned, okay, now here's something you can actually do. You can join this. And, um, and in some cases, maybe even make it a condition for the trip so that it's not simply um, tourism. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that that's, that's what's missing, the organization. Um, about two years ago, yeah, it would have been spring of 2019, there was a letter excuse me, that several of us put together to the Congressional Black Caucus. Mm -hmm. It was around the time that Congresswoman Omar was under assault. Mm -hmm. And um, a number of us felt like the rest of the CBC wasn't speaking up enough about the assault on her and the assault on those supporting Palestinian rights. Um, and what I realized in the process was that the CBC getting a letter from even a hundred activists is not the same as Congresswoman X or Congressman Y getting a letter from a hundred constituents. Yes. Right? It, it's completely different. And no matter how prominent the names are of a generic list, a hundred people in someone's congressional district is something that they will pay attention to. And, uh, and so building that kind of organization, I think, is, is what's desperately needed. Do you believe, you know, we're on the heels of this sort of, particularly in the Black liberation movement, um, the movement for Black lives has gotten a lot of attention. Um, and you know, I, although they did have a statement in their platform that they uh, created in 2016, I believe, mm -hmm. um, I still don't know if there has been a touchstone in terms of, you know, Black uh, Palestinian movement and, and working with them. I do know back in 2014 when um, uh, Mike Brown was killed, um, many of us went to Ferguson um, to do battle with the police back then. Um, I went to, there was a, an event that was created called Ferguson October, where many of us went um, to be in solidarity and I was part of the Palestinian um, contingent. But I'm not sure how things have gelled. I mean, do you think this may be sort of a generational kind of a thing or? No, no, I don't think it's generational. I think that it goes back to that earlier problem. I, I take the movement for black lives uh, at their word that this is an issue that they think is important. 
I believe that. Uh, I believe that they're very sincere about that. But it is one of a number of issues. Uh And on top of which, one of the problems, even in the progressive world, is that it's very easy for us to forget the international arena. Yes. Um, And and to, to downplay it. So that's why I think... It's great that the Movement for Black Lives has a pro-Palestinian statement. If we want them to do something, then there has to be somebody who's making that call. Um, And, you know, a few years ago, there was an attempt to build something like that, that, uh, you know, didn't, it, it was unfortunate that it didn't go very far, in part because there was, to build something like this, you need a core of people that basically say, this is what we're going to be doing. Um, and, and so even things like uh, Blacks for Palestine, uh-huh. uh, which I think has been a very good effort. They were successful in getting, what, a thousand signatures. Uh, I think that that was very good. But it's primarily an electronic network Uh of black leftists. And that's fine on one level. But in order to make change, you need more than a network of black leftists. Uh Um, You know, uh, Mark Harrison, someone you know who's very active, United Methodist Church, he and I attended one of their first meetings when they actually had a physical meeting. I can't remember. Were you there in, I, in, I, in Virginia? I, I think I, I was there. Yeah. yeah. And, and one of the things that struck me was when Mark asked about the churches. Mm-hmm. Are you reaching out to the churches? And, and it was almost as if he had asked, are you reaching out to the Martians? <laughs> It, it was sort of like, there was just like the silence and this sort of dismay that the question was even posed, which um, really frustrated Mark, frustrated me, because it, it was clear to me that if you're going to make really dig, uh, make real inroads, you've got to reach religious institutions, churches, mosques. So I think that that's a challenge. I don't think it's hopeless, but I do think that in order to get groups like the Movement for Black Lives and others to move, you need a core of people that say, we're going to push this. Um, you also, and particularly then when you go to organizations like the NAACP um, and, and other groups that get liberal money, um, you have to have a very well organized base, Felicia, because the pushback. I- I'll give you an example. I'm not going to name names. Um, when I did, when I took that delegation to Israel and Palestine, um, 2014. Now, sometime in 2012, I found out that two civil rights leaders, African-Americans that I knew, had been invited on an APAC trip to Israel. And I think it was APAC, but in this case, it was was a trip to Israel. And I um, reached out to one of them that I was closer to. And I said, hey man, why are you doing this trip? You know, it's gonna be like going to a Potemkin village. And, and, he said, no, no, I understand, but it's it's important and blah, 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 blah. And, um, and you know, what the Arab world needs to do is to finance a African-American trip there. And I said, that's a really good point. And so he decided to go on this trip anyway, which I thought was a terrible mistake. And... And it was shortly after that, literally, that I realized that God existed. Not that I didn't know before. Because out of nowhere, Felicia, I was contacted 
and asked whether I would put together a delegation of African Americans to go to Israel and Palestine huh. by a, a, a foundation hmm. that was um, out, uh, it was made up of Arabs. And so I said, of course. So the first person I called was this guy from the civil rights movement. Right? Mm -hmm. And I said, knock, knock. I said, guess what? He said, what? I said, God exists. <laughs> and he said, what are you talking about? And I told him, I said, so you ready to go? He started laughing. And he says, well, that's really great to hear, Bill. He said, are you going to hear both sides while you're there? I said, what do you mean hear both sides? He said, well, no, you got to hear both sides. I said, listen, man. I said, we hear one side all the time. Why would I ask Arabs to finance a delegation to go meet with the Zionists? He says, well, you know, this is a delegation that's going to be really observed and blah, 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 blah. I said, yeah, but I said, you told me to come up with the money. I came up with the money. This isn't going to cost you anything. So he said, uh, well, okay, keep me informed as, as this delegation is put together. And then let's revisit this. Yeah. I did. And he stopped returning my phone calls. Interesting. Completely. And I've seen him since. And he has never once said to me, Bill, I'm sorry, I didn't have the guts. Um, he'd never said, Bill, what happened on the trip? He said nothing. The other, the other person I reached out to was the other civil rights person who um, had gone on a trip, who I had met years and years ago, but she knew who I was. And I called her several times to invite her on a trip, left detailed messages on her voicemail, never once got a return phone call. Hmm. So it became clear, it's clear that if you don't have organization, there's pressure on these folks that they're going to, they're going to, um, they're going to balk. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right. I think also, uh, you know, kind of going back to religion, I think for a lot of younger people, especially, there has been so much what we call church hurt <laughs> and church trauma mm -hmm. that it, it's hard for them to really look at the institution of church, particularly Christian church, um, in, a, in a way that, you know, many of us who came out of the civil rights movement looked at it as an, as an organizing institution and a place for where things began. So I think that might have been part of the reason why um, at that meeting yes. in Virginia, the, you know, some of the younger organizers were like, no, we're not doing that. Um, yeah, I agree. But and, I also, and I'm not a church going person. No, I you know. know. I'm not a <laughs> <laughs> I know. You know, just not. But, but I know that that's where you got to go. Right. To get, right, as part of our, you know, building a united front. But let's go back to, to church because, you know, mm -hmm. the church and, 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 and the black piece of this, you know, we talked a little bit about this um, in our discussion mm -hmm. um, the other night in terms of, you know, the whole idea of going to the Holy Land and how anti-Semitism and Zionism kind of comes into play, particularly when you're talking about black people trying to straddle that line of, and for, for many of us trying to straddle that line as activists in going into the religious institutions, particularly the black church and talking about Palestine because it's, it's a hard line to cross. Um, you know, we do have a, some uh, Christian ministers who are liberal, but they a lot of them have paid the price for talking about Palestine mm -hmm. and Israel, like you know people mm -hmm. like um, Reverend Hagler in, in Washington D.C. Um, and even I know uh, we're trying to get Reverend William Barber to kind of come into this, but he's been a little slow coming into mm -hmm. it. So, could you talk a little bit about that that uh, oh yeah that line? 
So I think when you're talking about uh, black folks in Palestine, um, not among the supporters, uh, but among the uh, those who are more reticent, let's say, there's there's a combination of a particular interpretation of the Bible, and there's a, the particularities of World War II and its immediate aftermath. So in terms of the Bible, to the extent to which people believe that the Bible is literal truth and that the current people who are understood to be Jews are the descendants of the Israelites, you can get a certain kind of sympathy for variations on Christian Zionism. Um, And it can be kind of soft in the sense of, well, this was their land. Um, Or it can be the the more um, cynical Christian Zionism that Jews are our step to heaven. Um, so, So you have that. And to the extent to which there's not a discussion in churches about the history of the Holy Land and the, the, the emergence and decline of different religions, stuff like that, um, people are influenced by a myth. It's a very powerful myth. The second thing is the uh, World War II and its immediate aftermath. Uh-huh. So the the racism of the fascist powers uh, was something that simply could not be overlooked. And what was done to the Jews in the Holocaust um, obviously received global attention. The um, and and the guilt that many of the Western powers felt for having done nothing when the Nazis were annihilating Jews, uh, translated up and down the line in terms of the different populations. Now, within the United States, there's an odd thing that happened, which is uh, something that uh, several scholars have written about, Mm -hmm. which is that the Many white Americans, on the one hand, felt sympathy for the Jewish plight post the Holocaust, but didn't want the Jews to come to the United States. Mm -hmm. So they were prepared to support the creation of Israel. I think for African Americans, it was something very different. It was a perception of what the Arab world was at that time. Uh, The idea that the Arab world was nothing but corrupt, feudalistic monarchs, many of whom had sold their souls to the Europeans. Um, And then you have the survivors of the Holocaust, the survivors of this historic, racist uh, offensive and and their demand for justice. Uh At least that's the way it was being portrayed. And so I think that there was some latent sympathy that developed, believing that supporting Israel was in effect an anti-racist stand. Oh. It, was, it was in favor of a form of racial justice. Um, and I also suspect that the minds and eyes of many African Americans were clouded by anti-Arab propaganda and to some extent Islamophobia mm-hmm. that um, that made the Arab world seem less than civilized. Oh. So all of these things I think contributed and, and then on top of that of course you have the very active presence of U.S. Jews in the civil rights movement and in other progressive struggles. So For some African-Americans, it felt like a logical thing that any kind of partnership would necessitate our support for Israel. 
But all of this was done in the absence of a real historical analysis. And therein lies the problem. Uh, and the, um, uh, I think that the PLO, uh, with the exception of the two guys that helped me in 1969, okay. were, were very slow to reach out to U.S. audiences huh. and do the kind of work that, for example, the African National Congress did or the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania did um, in reaching out particularly to African-Americans, but not just African-Americans, and, and, and presenting their case. The, the PLO, um, you know, I'm doing some work around the Western Sahara mm -hmm. and the, the, the Moroccan occupation. And I think that the Polisario, the liberation movement of the Sararis, um, made a similar mistake, uh, which was they did not, they, they received a lot of international support from different nations, but they didn't put enough attention on popular support, the support of people and social movement organizations. And so I think that this was a mistake by the PLO that, um, that they needed to have much earlier on put more attention into building a real solidarity presence and reaching out to, in our case, Black America in its entirety. Uh, because in the absence of that, you, I mean, you had organizations, the Nation of Islam, you had the Black Panther Party, you had various communist groups, um, but at a mass level, there just hasn't been enough. Huh. Do you think this may be part of the reason why it's, you know, in mainstream politics, for example, um, and, and, and you're right, uh, you talked about how uh, for, for African-Americans especially, it seems like we are losing a sense of internationalism, um, particularly like in, in this last election, you know, the focus was totally on domestic issues. Nobody, I mean, and, and for, for good reason on, on one level, but as I always say, what goes on over there is gonna eventually hit over here. So how do we get black people, especially to, to begin to look at, you know, international issues, including um, the, our, our complicity with, with Israel um, on an in, on a electoral, but also as, as especially as we're coming into this next uh, administration, mm -hmm. you know, which we I don't think there's not going to be that much difference in terms of what what has what has been done in the past. But I really feel I get frustrated because you know we we don't talk enough about what's going on in terms of you know not even Africa as much anymore. Um, and I get very frustrated with that because I think as African-American people, we're going to lose out on some of these policy issues as, as these decisions get, get made and the domestic pieces get folded into the international pieces, we're gonna lose out even more. And that frustrates me. So I, I just wanted to hear your take on that. Well, um... It ain't going to be easy. Nice. I mean, it's like there's no silver bullet. I mean, one of the things is that we live in a very big country, which has been at the heart of a global empire. And it's easy to be here and to click off from the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. You don't really need to learn another language, for example. Right. Um, many people know next to nothing about geography or world history. That's the truth, yeah. Um, so so part, of the, part of this starts with a major educational effort that we have to undertake huh. about the world. Um, the second thing is that many people don't think that international affairs matter. Hmm unless people from the United States are dying. So if we go to war, it, 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 here's the thing. Like you think about when we went to Vietnam 
thousands of U.S. troops were dying or coming back injured. Um, so the material reality of this aggressive policy hit people in the face. Mm -hmm. Now you flip forward to the 1980s and you start looking at the U.S. wars in Central America. Well, by and large, those were not carried out by U.S. troops. Uh, if they were, if there were U.S. troops, there were special operations. They were mainly carried out by mercenaries or by the troops of various countries like El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras. And, and so it's like you didn't have body bags coming oh. back. Uh -huh. um, and you didn't, you didn't necessarily have this feeling that if we don't get out of El Salvador, if we don't stop aiding the race war in Guatemala, that there will be consequences here. So part of our job, I think, becomes one of um, demonstrating to people the relationship between foreign policy and domestic policy. Uh -huh. Um, the third thing is that we have to exhibit some level of patience. And, and so I, I go back to when we formed um, uh, United for Peace and Justice uh, uh, in, against the Iraq War. So I think we did a marvelous job. Um, the February 15th demonstrations, incredible. Uh, it was very, very broad. But once Bush launched the war and was successful in overthrowing Saddam Hussein fairly quickly, um, even with the resistance that emerged, which was a real mixed bag in, in Iraq, uh, for many people it felt like the war was over. We hadn't, we hadn't been able to prevent the war. So what the hell? Right. And, and I think that we, uh, we were wrong, that, that we, we failed to appreciate that it's very difficult to stop a ruling class from going to war unless there's divisions within that class. That anti-war movements become successful in helping to bring wars to an end. Uh -huh. and, and that meant that we needed to have a longer term view uh, about UFPJ and about the Iraq war. And I think that that's true generally in terms of foreign policy. I think you're right. I think, uh, you know, I, I remember those days and I, I remember how people just got really deflated and depressed mm -hmm. because, you know, we didn't stop the war. Mm -hmm. But what we did do is that we slowed things down. I mean, things, right. didn't, things didn't get as bad as they could have had we not done anything. So I think you're right. We have to, I mean, I think a large part of this for me anyway, is I do get frustrated, but I think you are right in the fact that we have to um, allow people to catch up. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we forget our own rules that we have to meet people where they are in terms of a lot of this, uh, you know, in terms of getting to a point of understanding where we are and you know trying to integrate a lot of a lot of these issues into the domestic issues and you know this this time has been crazy in terms of just trying to get the last crazy out of the, the out of the white house you know right. so i understand um the sort of not putting the emphasis on anything international i mean fortunately by the grace of god nothing happened in terms of anything international, in terms of any wars or anything blowing up here in the United States. But I, I, I wanna get your take as we're kind of winding down on, you know, what do you see for the future, not only, you know, in, in terms of Israel, Palestine and our work, um, you know, we're coming upon this new administration, which a lot of people are calling mm -hmm. Obama 1.5 or 2.0. Yeah. Um, I mean, Kamala Harris has has already stated that, you know, we're going to be a friend of Israel and, you know, we're not, you know, we're not going to stray from that, uh, mm -hmm. that policy. So 
what do you what do you see for the future and what do you think we need to do um, to shore that up? So first of all, we're not out of the woods yet, Felicia. Um, I am very worried that Trump is still capable of doing a number of things. First of all, Michael Flynn is advocating that he declare martial law and redo the elections. Uh, we know that a few weeks ago that um, he was talking about attacking Iran. Mm -hmm. And I think that this guy is capable of almost anything. Uh, so I, I want to just say that uh, and knock on wood. The, uh, the second thing is that I don't really care what Biden and uh, Harris is saying right now. Um, my attitude is what can we push them on? Mm. All right. So there's a few things that we've got to really think about. There's uh, an ongoing effort at repression, domestic repression around issues of Palestine, attempts to render illegal boycott, divestment and sanctions. Yes. So one of the things I think we have to be doing is building a very broad front uh, around democracy and civil liberties. And, and that even if people don't agree with us on BDS, we need them to understand what's at stake in attempts to render it illegal. And, and so I think that that's, that's something that's very critical. Uh, the second thing is that, again, not to be a broken record, we need an African-American presence around Palestine. Mm -hmm. um, it, it simply cannot be a few of us that are called upon every so often to speak out. Mm -hmm. It's got to be something that develops an ongoing campaign, an ongoing presence, uh, and where we are leaning on the Congressional Black Caucus. Mm -hmm. um, we need to make it a significant political issue for the members of the Congressional Black Caucus. And it sort of goes along the lines of that famous story about Franklin Roosevelt, when he had the meeting with A. Philip Randolph, oh, and right. Randolph was laying out all the demands, and then Roosevelt says, okay, go out there and make me do it. Yeah. Right? Yes. That's the approach that we've got to take. Um, I think we also need to engage in a theological battle. Uh -huh. uh, and, and I think this is where people like Reverend Hagler and others, uh, I think, have been very, very valuable. And we just need to multiply them. That, that we need to take on the Zionist interpretation of the Bible. And, and, and look at the question uh, of the Middle East from a historical standpoint. Um, and so this theological battle is linked to a proper understanding of the history of the region. Uh, the, um, another thing that does become very important, particularly among uh, us as African-Americans, the parallels with the Palestinians are um, very much with apartheid South Africa uh -huh. and with Native Americans. Uh -huh. uh, the, the, uh, the settler colonial project known as Israel is in part popular within the United States because it is in effect what the European settlers did to the Native Americans beginning in 1607. And the whole thinking that went into the settler colonial experiment that eventually becomes the United States is what we see in what Israel has been carrying out in the original uh, borders of 1948 and subsequently in the occupied territories. Uh, people need to see that and understand those parallels and what that means. Uh, and, and see, what I've been arguing for a long time is that 
many white Americans are, find it difficult to object to Israel because Israel basically says to white Americans, how can you object? This is what you did. You did the same thing to the Native Americans, uh-huh. right? You did the same thing to the Hawaiians. Uh-huh. You know, you did, you, you, you're you doing that to Puerto Ricans. I mean, uh-huh. it's like you go on and on. And so I think our argument has to be strengthened around this issue of settler colonialism and what that all means, which we African-Americans, we understand that. Uh, so I think that there's all of these things, Felicia, that have to be undertaken, but they have to be done at a very broad level, which goes to this final point, which is that there'll be many people that will agree with us on Palestine, but may not agree with us on other things. Mm-hmm. I'm having this experience right now around the Western Sahara. Huh. There are a whole lot of Republicans, believe it or not, that are very anti-Moroccan. Yes, I know. (laughs) No joke. Um, Very anti-Moroccan. And uh, and want to see the end of the occupation. And I have been very recently put in the position of, Bill, you're going to have to work with some of these Republicans. Mm -hmm. Something I, by and large, have never done. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, And so, but if we can agree on the Western Sahara, then I'm prepared to shake hands and to do it together. The same thing around Israel and Palestine. There will be people that we may not agree with on a number of things, but we have to find a way of working with them, Mm -hmm. which actually leads to my final point, which I I think the last one was supposed to be my final point, but this is um, (laughs) taking up the issue of Palestine means that we have to be the strongest opponents of anti-Semitism yeah. of any force, and that we cannot tolerate anti-Jewish sentiment, uh, the the Jewish conspiracy theories, uh, or the conspiracy theories that revolve around Jews. Um, we, you know, we have to be the ones that point out that the real anti-Semites are these right-wing maniacs Mm -hmm. that may in fact support Israel because they believe in an ethno-nationalist state and they don't, they want to clean the Jews out of everywhere else. Mm -hmm. And they want to use that as a model for the creation of ethno-national states around the world. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we're talking about fascists and people that are Mm crypto-fascists along those lines. We have to be the ones that are pointing out no, we're not going to tolerate this anti-Semitism. And we're not going to engage in the kind of Jew baiting and Jew hunting that these anti-Semites do. We're not going to lead people to believe, for example, that the U.S. is invested in Israel because of some Jewish conspiracy here. Um, we have to We have to really break from that. Because, see, if we don't, If we don't win the battle on anti-Semitism, then our movement will be forever branded. And so whoever is engaged in this fight needs to be at the forefront in opposing anti-Semitism. I think that's a very good place for us to leave this discussion. Uh, We could go on and on, but I think our time is up. And I really thank you for um, coming on and sharing your views. And I think, you know, as this is supposed to be sort of a uh, a tutorial for people who are looking to learn more about activism within within the Black Palestinian liberation, um, I think it's also a way for us to, you know, look at things and, and, and figure out how to go forward um, as we're entering this new phase of life. So, Thank you so much, Bill. I'm so appreciative of you and and your support of of the movement, also your support of me and and everything else. So um, thank you so much. Pleasure. And and I wish you a very good day. I am absolutely too. And I hope that people listening to this, Felicia, that African-Americans that are interested, that they reach out to you 
not to give you more work, but that they reach out to you <laughs> and say, hey, let's rock and roll. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. All right. Be well. Take you too. Care. Take care. Bye.